Good evening. Welcome to Dateline, Sarasota. Tonight we're going to do the second part of uh, an interview with uh, Dr. Ferdy Pacheco, affectionately known as the Fight Doctor, a man who's done many things, uh, is currently an author and a painter, uh, and uh, has got this book, uh, Art of Ybor City, that's uh, currently for sale at Sarasota Book and News. Ferdy, in, in going through your, your books and, and your life's history, you've done so many things, waiter, uh, doctor, uh, painter, author. Uh, but one of the most interesting things I think you've done uh, that uh, you haven't really talked a lot about uh, was the time you spent as a, as a medical practitioner, not in uh, uh, the, the rich parts of America, but uh, really one of the, the toughest places still in this country, and that was the Overtown section of Miami. Uh, what, what was it like then, and what, what, you know, what attracted you to do that? And, and you know, is what's going on in America today? that prevents more and more people from getting in to the, the lower classes of society to really help them out and help themselves? Well, That's a big uh, question. To, to, a lot well, of I mean, to, to get yeah. into it, uh, you'd have to read the first short story in uh, the Ybor City Chronicles about Sweet Sam, a black delivery man that we had. It was very strange in that he was a, uh, an Uncle Tom to my mother and father, a uh, uh, workforce, but in the truck he sounded like William Shakespeare. He had a piano and he couldn't play it or wouldn't play it, a grand piano, and he had a wife that couldn't or wouldn't talk. And as I, as we spent the summer delivering goods, it turned out he was an extremely intellectual man from New Orleans that was a, turned out to be that he had been a, a terrific leader in the jazz movement. Something happened to his wife, he was hiding out in Tampa. And he taught me a great deal about the English language. He had been taught by a uh, a professor McCutchie uh, uh, about the English language, and he taught me about the South. For example, I, I bought him a Cuban sandwich. It's a story in the book, and uh, and an SB beer. And he told me we couldn't we couldn't be seen eating together. This is 1940, I guess 39, 40. We couldn't be seen eating, even though we worked all day long delivering. I was the boss's son, and he was I was 12 or 10 or something like that, and he was a grown man, always dressed very elegantly. We couldn't be seen. We had to drive to Palmetto Beach, park the truck, open the, the door so it faced the water, and sit there and, and eat. We couldn't be seen eating together. And similarly, my father never knew that he could speak English very well. He said, it's very bad for a black man to be seen speaking English. He, he taught me how to walk with a black man. I had to walk ahead of him. He walked right behind me. He couldn't walk equal to me. He couldn't be seen holding my, when I was little, he held my hand going across the street, but after that, he couldn't touch me. He, he didn't look at my mother in the face, he looked down. And um, it's what he had to do to fit in with the times. But I, as I grew up, I, I was very indignant by that. I, I got very indignant about him because I saw he's such an intelligent man and, and he's hiding uh, to hide, to protect his wife. And he, he was doomed to do that for the rest of his, of his time on earth. I mean, he never got to play the piano again. He never got to use his talent. And so, um, the measure of love is what you're willing to give up for it, was his saying, and that saying applied to him. Well, as I grew up, I, I really felt he was one thing, but everything that I read about, I, mean, I was a big student of the Civil War. I mean, I read a lot about the Civil War, and I'm imbued with this patriotism that there was at my house about America. And I realized, although I was a Southerner, you know, and, and every, all of my heroes were Southerners, Jeb Stewart, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, brilliant military commanders, but I always knew that it was a good thing we lost that war. I mean, you know, hey, and we, you can root about it just so far, but it's a dang good thing we lost it because there was slavery in the, in the bargain. That was wrong. And as I went to the University of Florida, and I went to Tennessee and Alabama, and I went all over the South, I found this tremendous discrimination, which I thought was so unfair. I mean, you know, there were waiting rooms. I have one of, one of the paintings that I have, I don't think I'll ever sell out of this book, is called... Um, uh, segregation in the trolley, where I come in and I was around about 14 and I wanted to sit in the back of the trolley where it said for coloreds only and there was a guy sitting there with a full uniform on with medals and, uh, and crutches and, and uh, wound stripes. He'd just been in, in, uh, um, in, in, Euro in the European theater, whether it was Africa or Normandy, I can't remember which, but anyway, he was wounded. He was sitting in the back, he couldn't sit in the front. And when I went to sit back on the guy stopped the streetcar. He said, what do you think you're doing? I said, I'm sitting next to this soldier who came back from fighting, he said, either get up front where you belong or get off the streetcar. And, and the soldiers looked at me like saying, listen, I had all the trouble I need. I really don't need you to get me into more trouble. Go sit in the front. I didn't, thank you for the gesture. Just go sit in the front. Don't bother me. And, uh, you know, then I went to medical school. I went to Jackson Memorial Hospital. It was a huge workload of black people that, that we took care of. And, uh, and, and, it, and 
my father had died, and he had always told me to, to, that, that God gave you this brain so that you could be a doctor and so that you could help poor people who weren't as smart as you were. That, that, that some people are born smart and some people aren't as smart. So the smarts should take care of the ones that aren't as smart or economically privileged or so forth. And I, I grew up with that. I went to, to internship at Mount Sinai Hospital. It's all rich people. What a drag that was. I mean, you know, like these people didn't need anything. They were just babying along. You know, there were, it was like nothing. It was like candy. I said, hey, these people don't need a doctor. You know, they need a psychiatrist. I got to go where there's doctor, where they need a doctor. And, and it so happened that as I got through with internship, an office was open, I didn't have a dime. Or I could move in, pay nothing at all, and start making around 500 bucks a week. But you had to work like a dog from early in the morning till late at night. $5 a, a, a pop for, for each patient, no matter what you did for them. Injections, give them free medicine, so forth. And I, I liked it so much that I decided that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to do this. And I'm, I'm never going to have a, and I, and I did it for 20 some odd years. I mean, I didn't just tool around for a little while. No bills, would never send a bill. If you could pay, you paid. If you couldn't pay, next time try to catch up. Five bucks a visit, never more. If somebody came in with two children, five bucks a visit for all three of them. A family, all three of them. No bill for anybody up to the age of two. From birth to two, no bill. From 65 on, no bill. That's before Medicare and Medicaid. Right. So uh, you might well ask, you went broke in a minute? No, no. Trust insurance companies to be so crooked that they made me a, almost a millionaire by being in there. Because God has a strange way, I do believe, I, I believe in God, and I think things equal out. God showed me a way. If God can be crooked, he must have a little part of crookedness in him. God showed me a way that because of, of, of the inherent wrongness of our system of insurance and lawyers and courts and all of that, who, who are the people that get in, 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 in work accidents? Black people. Mm -hmm. They're the mules of our society. Who are the people that get in automobile accidents and go to smart lawyers to get themselves two or three thousand dollars to, to start a business? Black people. And where was I? In the middle of the black people. I was the only guy there. The only guy there for 20,000 people. Could talk, could go to court, was with Ali. I'd go to court. I had the case one. I'd sit down and the judge says, what do you think Ali's next move is going to be? Tell the jury about this last fight you were in. I mean, you walked in. It was a joke. It was like, there's Pacheco. Well, it's won the case. You know, there's no, no problem. So all of a sudden, all this money was coming in to pay for the charitable thing. And then you know, along about the 10th year that I was there, I think, Medicare came in to pay these poor people, the, oh, the 65 on, and Medicaid to pay the rest. Now I had it coming in every window. I mean, if I had charged, if I had charged mm -hmm. what I was doing, if I had billed for what I was doing, I would bill over a million a year, million dollars. Mm -hmm. I would have been on the front page of the, of the paper. I just, just wouldn't even make up the bills. I'd say, forget about that. I mean, you know, and, and it brought about a disintegration of the system because these poor, these 65-year-old people, sons of slaves, illiterates, scared to death of white people, couldn't go to Jackson Memorial House, couldn't get there. If they got there, they would be seen by third and fourth year your students, scared to death of anybody white. Didn't understand what people were saying because they're speaking to them in English they didn't understand. Half of them were foreign students that couldn't understand it. Didn't understand how to take their medicine. What, what did they have at my office? You could walk there from any place in the ghetto. You talked with somebody who talked your dialect because I talked like a black man with a, with, a, with a patient. Some said, well, that's very condescending or patronizing. I said, no, that's... That's what you got to do to communicate with a patient. If I have to sound black, if I have to say, take two aspirins behind Coke, mm -hmm. behind Coke is not the right way to say it, but they understand what I'm saying. If you have to say cascade instead of vomit, that's what you got to say. You got to speak to the patient in his language. Similarly, in the Cuban place, I spoke, spoke like a Cuban. So therefore, what, what happened was a total involvement in trying to make the system work. To get, I, in, during that period, I tried to get black people in the medical school, hard to do. Black people in the law school, politic like crazy to get people in the political system to run for, for, for different offices. We got a school superintendent in. You know, it was like everything was happening. 
And this, now we're talking about the revolution, the 60s and the 70s. Right. Bombs were flying, bullets were flying. Martin Luther King was around my office all the time. Uh, uh, Malcolm X was a good friend of Ali's, got killed because he tried to recruit Ali. That happened right in front of me, around, around me, and, and so forth. Malcolm X was brilliant, but he was bucking the wrong people. Mm -hmm. He was bucking killers. I know the guy that killed him. I know how they set it up. Was it, was it the black man? Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. I mean, I mean it was... I mean, it was like one of, uh, one of Ali's Muhammad bodyguards. Said. Yeah, one of Ali's bodyguards set up. He was like the enforcer. They knocked off a lot of people. And, and uh, uh, it was like a miracle that I'm here talking to you because the politics were so... so it's crackling. And the, what, what, uh, when I started, they were very happy to have a white person of some uh, prestige especially since I got into boxing, became very prestigious to, for them. And then we got the crazies, the zanies. We got the guys that throw bombs in the store just because the complexion is white. Mm -hmm. And they don't care what you've done and who you've been with. You're white and you don't belong there and they want to shoot you. I mean, I had a lot of those. I mean, for me to be here talking to you is, is some kind of survival thing. But I can't write about it because one of the things I never talked about, I think this is the first, outside of a Larry King interview, it went till, till 5 in the morning, one, one morning when we were really hot in the thing, and fighting the government like crazy and fighting everybody like crazy. The, uh, my, my father also taught me one thing. And, I mean, as you can see, I'm, I'm a, a word machine. I mean, I like to talk, and I love to tell stories. And I like to entertain. But he always said, if you're going to do something for somebody, shut up. And really. He said, if you're going to brag about it, then you didn't do it for them. You did it for you. Mm -hmm. You're trying to feel good about it. Don't, I mean, if you're going to be there and helping black people, shut up. Let it speak for itself. Let the work speak for itself. For 20 years, I never said anything. Once you get into this self-promotion that requires, you see, I, I went a complete change in my life. If you follow up to the time I was, I, I, I quit at 50. You didn't see me talking about myself on talk shows and so forth because as a doctor, you don't talk about yourself. No. I, I didn't, I mean, I talk boxing, but that's it. But then I got into self-promotion because I'm writing movies, I'm doing books, I'm doing paintings. That's all self-promotion. Sure. You've got to talk about yourself. But so then th th it became a different thing. Right. But, but again, you know, if, if you read through your books, you do talk about this whole idea that you were raised with, with your father's direction. You know, as you look over your, the spectrum of your life and see where we are today with a president that still says we're a racist society, somehow we should get back together. What's happened, Ferdy, that has changed so dramatically the ability of people like yourselves to move into a poor neighborhood, be appreciated, helped out, and today it's gotten to be, in many cases, a war zone. Well, I mean, we've it, had there's a great generality so involved. And, and, and uh, we were talking before we came on camera that I can't really write a book because you, I, I wanted to write a, a column for the Herald on the pleasures of being a Southerner. You can't write that anymore. I could many years ago. You can't write it now. I just wanted to write about the simple pleasures of being a University of Florida Gator and getting up and singing Dixie at every touchdown. I, I didn't do that as a racist. I didn't have any idea that was racist connotation. Dixie was Abraham Lincoln's favorite favorite song. I mean, it was just a joyful, happy thing. The rebel yell was a rebel yell. Everybody knew the Civil War history. I had no idea uh, of anti-black in any of that. And yet, now it's become anathema. And now they're even trying to remove Robert E. Lee's name from it. They've gone too far over the other way. I'm going to say a generalization which probably will get me in trouble again, which is not, nothing new. But if you really, I mean, I've studied immigration, immigrants, us, the Italians, the Irish, the Vietnamese, we all have one thing in common and one tremendous advantage over blacks. Everybody says, how come a Vietnamese guy gets here? 25 years later, he owns a block of Harlem and he owns a, the corner drugstore because he sits there and he brings his family. Everybody works 15 hours a day. They don't spend any money. They're spending them. They're buying and they're buying and they're... Um, colored people have been here for two or 300 years, blacks, we can now say. Well, why haven't they owned anything? Why can't they do anything? Why do they? And... Uh, and, and Again, this generalization, and, and, and I'm pleased if you're watching and, and, and don't write to me, just think about it. Think of, of the way I say it. The difficulty the blacks have and will always have is that we, the rest of the United States, are different from them for one, only one way, the color of their skin. That's the only way we're different. 
But it's such a big difference that we can't seem to overcome this natural reluctance to accept them as equals. They can't seem to overcome the fact that they're black, so that they now have polarized themselves in the other way. Black is best, black is beautiful, and sought a separatism from us. The black Muslim nation of Islam wants to be separate. These people want to be separate. Well, no, 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 no. What we wanted to do was a melting pot. All of us melt together, but they, it's oil and water. They don't mix because of the color of the skin. When we can get rid of the adjective black to describe anybody, in the newspapers will be way ahead. The black quarterback of the Pittsburgh team, the mm, black mm. chief of staff, the black doctor that operated. No, 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 the no, first no. black president. A of black the, astronaut. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Stop saying black in front of somebody. If we could assimilate, if we could, and I spent my lifetime trying to do it. I once was married, and this, again, I was the first lady that I married. I, before Lucita, which I've lived completely happily. I had a wonderful daughter of a senator I was married to. The senator was a real southerner. At the end of every meal, we lived with him at their house while I was getting ready to go to law, medical school. We walked around the block three or four times. During that time, I tried to convince him, because I was a raging liberal, about the blacks were being oppressed. They couldn't vote. They just came back from Europe from being shot. They come back to the South. They can't vote. Something's wrong. I mean, something's wrong. They can't get in school. They get the GI Bill of Rights, but they can't go to the University of Florida. Uh-oh, something's wrong. And so I'm talking to him, talking to him, talking to him, talking to him. At the end of about a year, I mean, and I knew much more about the Civil War than he did. All his folks fought in the Civil War, but he didn't know anything close to what I did. I mean, I'm a scholar about the Civil War. And finally, I wore him down intellectually, and I could speak much better English than he could, <laughs> even though he was a judge and a senator. And so I'm wearing him down with... with big words and, and big ideas and so forth. And he finally said, he narrowed it down to this. And this is exactly what I just said in a sentence by a senator. He said, Ferdy, what you've just been talking about for a year, I think you're right up here. My mind tells me you're correct. Here and here, I can't accept it. So in my heart and in my guts, I just can't accept it. Maybe your grandchildren or your grandchildren children will be able to. Maybe when we go that far, we'll be able to. My generation won't. Your generation won't. The next generation will less. And we see that, that the, the, this, this terrible difference of color of skin, a freak of nature, just because somebody's brown instead of white, doesn't make them a different person. They're the same people. I mean, they're the same human being. As a biologist and anatomist, that's what I always used to say. Is if you cut the skin off and put white skin on, then they're okay? I mean, why, what's the difference? And we now see that, that we've, all revolutions, yin and yang, you know. We right. won the revolution. We won. We got them in. We got them to be uh, uh, mayors and governors and, and astronauts and generals and the head chief. We got that. We got movie stars, big time movie stars. Eddie Murphy, got millions of dollars they're getting. We got the greatest athletes in the world, all black. We got the greatest jazz musicians in the world, all black. I mean, you know, we've got this wonderful, wonderful culture of black people. Yet, somehow, they can't get out of the ghetto. Somehow, they can't improve themselves. Somehow, the welfare system doesn't help them, it hurts them. It doesn't help them. They get lazy. They get, why should I go work? I can get half that amount of money by sitting on my porch. I mean, it's, it's different. The difference was, and, and I'm, I'm going to get specific, then I'm going to stop talking about this. In the two offices that I had, the black office and the Cuban office. The black office, the guy got hurt on the job. He never wanted to go back to work. You had to shoot him to get him back to work. Hey, you're all right. Go back to work. Hey, give me another five weeks of sitting on the porch. He'd rather take half the money and sit on the porch. That was just the nature of that ghetto. The Cuban guy, you'd have to get a gun to keep him from getting another job when he was hurt. He was hurt. He couldn't move his back. Can I be an elevator operator? Can I be a guard at night? Can I have a second job? This guy was trying to work. He wanted to buy the grocery store. He wanted to buy this. He wanted to buy that. Well, that, that is a, a depressing generality of the South that we had. But I thought, couldn't we, isn't the cure education? That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they going to the University of Florida? Why aren't they in Harvard? Why aren't they in Yale? Why aren't they every place? And we got them in. And then things started to disintegrate. If they couldn't produce, somebody says, well, yeah, but, you know, their children were, they were children of slaves and blah, blah, blah. 
pass them anyway, even if they didn't get a passing grade. And, and that was, to my way of thinking, the wrong way to attack them. So you can't just get somebody a, a doctor's degree because they're black. Then you're going the other side of racism. Now you're giving them a degree because they're black. No, that's as bad as restraining it from them. Because they're going to go out there and kill people. So the doctor doesn't so, know. So, so what's the way out, Ferdy? Well, I mean, you know, I, mean I, you, I think you, the way out, now, now that I have been slapped in the face a lot and kicked in, in the behind a lot with all kinds of theories going back, I think it's a long, drawn-out process of assimilation where we are moving, albeit very slowly. There are no cures. You don't wave a wand and say, everybody in the South think that black people are equal to whites. Okay. Okay, I just talked to a lady last night. I was in a last night. We were having supper with a president, a bank president, and his and his wife had come back from South Carolina. She went in a golf shop to ask for a book by Tiger Woods. South Carolina. The guy said, "You don't want to buy a book by Tiger Woods, do you?" She said, "Well, this is a golf shop, isn't it?" He says, "Yeah, but you don't want to buy Tiger Woods' book. There's no white folks around here would buy a book about a black guy playing." She says, "What?" I mean, the guy's the greatest <laughs> golfer. What if she's like, so this girl was Cuban. And I mean, the, the, the president's, and, and she came back, she said, is that the way it is in the South? I said, unfortunately, that is the way it is in some parts of the South. But we're getting there. But it just takes a long time. What's going to happen in the South? We're going to be in, this is Civil War all over again. We're going to be invaded by Yankees. Well, we are. This whole place is Yankees. I mean, right. there aren't going to be any Southerners. Do you, see, do you hear me talk like a Southerner? Well, if you'd have seen me when I was going to the University of Tennessee and in Alabama, I sounded like uh, I was on General Lee's staff. I had a very thick Southern accent because you couldn't get a date without it. You know, that, was a different, <laughs> that, was a, that was a whole different motivation. No, I, I, the, a, there is no easy answer, and, and the answer lies in patience and the passage of time. These things that we try, busing, uh, uh, passing people just because they're black are all phases of a revolution that yin and yang. Mm -hmm. Some things work, some things don't. Mm -hmm. Just because they're passed as law doesn't mean it works. It means you've got to go try it. And if it doesn't, pull back and let's try again some other way. I believe, I, I honestly believe that sports, it may sound fascist, but I always thought sports were like a joke. I mean, I'm a doctor. I'm, I'm right. about serious things. Sports was a playground. Sports were what kids do. But I see different now. Through Ali, I see it through Ali's eyes. Sports makes a difference. Because before there was, before there was Ali, way before there was Ali, there was Joe Lewis. And there was Jackie Robinson. And those people made themselves non-blacks. They made themselves white. They didn't, but, but that's not sounds right. They made it, they were colorless. White people didn't consider them a black. Joe Lewis, in the height of the, the biggest, worst racism we ever known in the 30s, could walk in any place to sit down. And he wouldn't because he was a very sensitive and, and, and dignified man. He didn't go any place he, he, he wasn't wanted. You think there was any place that Ali couldn't have walked into in the United States? Any place? Mm -hmm. When Ali was Ali, he could have walked anywhere he wanted to. And, and the same thing goes today. Sports transcends that. And so the more we see it, a black quarterback played for the Redskins and, and won the Super Bowl. Dun, 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 dun. But the sports, Tiger Woods that we're just talking about right now, makes people forget color. If we could just do that yeah. for the rest of the United States, if you could just forget color for a bus driver, forget color for a guy that cleans your yard, forget color for the doctor. That, uh, I mean, I, I had I, the, one of the best orthopedist in Miami was a black guy, Dr. Bacon. He was one of the best for knees. He operated on my wife's knee. He was, he was the best knee surgeon. I'd say, Dr. Uh, Bacon, he said, I'm going to send my wife. I would always have to say, hold it. I want you to understand one thing. He's the finest orthopedic surgeon, and he's black. If you got any problem with him being black, don't go. Because this guy doesn't play that game. He's a doctor, 100%, and you're the patient. Black, white, or Chinese doesn't make any difference to him. If it makes a difference to you, don't go. You know, because you'll be unhappy with him. So, uh, uh, you know, it became again, it's still, it ends this way. The United States has to, slow but sure, accept the fact that we are all equal and we're all Americans. Mm -hmm. When that happens and you quit, and they quit 
they as well as we quit being they and we, and we all become together, the, the, this, this, this momentary lapse we went through for the last 10 years where blacks wanted separate identification. Mm -hmm. Cubans want separate identification. So we, Italians want separate. Now, now the, the, the new, because we're getting really silly with words, yeah. we now can no longer say we're the melting pot. We now say we're the salad. Mm -hmm. That's it. See, the salad is, you put a tomato in a salad, it's still a tomato. You put lettuce in a salad, it's still a lettuce. You put mm -hmm. an asparagus. So all these nationalities become America, but they're still separate and individuals. No, no, no. We're a melting pot. Mm -hmm. We're a puree. We all go in there. We came out, Dr. Pacheco, yeah. from Spanish parents and an American. Through, through. When, when you look at the, at the centers of America that, uh, that receive people, and Ybor City certainly was one, South Boston with the Irish. Uh, you know, Chinatown. Those, yeah, Chinatown. Those, for oh. the most part, and, and there are not that many left anymore for any of those places, but we still have the black ghettos, it seems, more than we do. And I think that's an interesting observation is that maybe, in fact, in, as you say, because of the difference in the color of skin, that it is going to take longer. Long. I mean, there is, there, there, were, there is a feeling of oppression, obviously, for so many years. Uh, and and, and that, that's going to take generational uh, change, which hopefully is going now with, with the, the younger generation. And, you know, uh, I, I, there I, are people that, like me who got disillusioned. My office got burned down to the ground. There's nothing left of my office. That's how I got out of medicine. Hmm. I mean, they burned it down to the ground with the McDuffie riots. Now, here's, here's the interesting part and the disillusioning part for a, a liberal like me, beaten down pretty good, by the way. When my place was burned down, I offered the property it was on was worth $50,000. I called the governor of Florida, the mayor, because it was a, a question of the Cubans uh, irritating the blacks, the McDuffie rights, Muhammad Ali, the black Muslim, Ed Herbert, and Don King. I said, any one of you put up a, a clinic, the most you could spend is $100,000. Because it's a basic clinic. This is not, it's an emergency room. Mm -hmm. This is not a hospital. It's a clinic for emergency. I have 20,000 people out here who need their prescriptions renewed, who are on regular medications, who need things. You call it anything you want to. I'll work in it a year provided that the staff is black. A black doctor, I already had black nurses. I'll work in it a year till everybody gets in there free. I won't charge anybody, and I'll donate the land. And let me tell you, I got thoroughly ignored by everybody, but guess who? Don King. Hmm. And before you start thinking good about Don King, which is all right to think because he was going to give me $100,000, coincidentally, I also happened to be the head of NBC by that time, making the fights, in other words, buying the fights from Don King. Mm -hmm. So the 100,000 carried some big strings with it. And to the everlasting credit of, of, of the NBC president, Watson, Arthur Watson, God rest his soul, he's dead now. I went to him and I said, Arthur, I got this problem. I got 20,000 black people who need doctors and so forth. Nobody's going to be down there. I can't be down there anymore. If King builds this thing for me, then the people will be saved. But the perception with a wise guy press of New York and television sources that I'm buying out, I'm selling out to Don King, and all of a sudden you'll see Don King fights on, on NBC, which there weren't any. And the problem is that that's the way it's going to be perceived. If I don't do it, it's because I'm trying to protect my bribe. The thing. If I do do it, it's because I had to, there's no way to win. And he said, Ferdy, we've had you investigated every way against the middle before we ever hired you. You have nothing wrong with you. You're absolute nothing. You've done everything in boxing free. You have no strings on your back. If you feel like that will save those people, go ahead and do it. We know you're not going to do anything with Don King different. Take the money, build the thing, and let them have, a, have their own place. And I, and I decided at that point I'd had enough because, and here's the point that I started to make with that story. Guess what the, the stumbling block was? Couldn't find a black doctor that wanted to come in a ghetto to practice. Why? Because they said they worked very hard to get out of the ghetto. Why would they want to go back into the ghetto? And that. So you never got the hundred thousand dollars. I signed off. King? No, that's where I signed off. I said goodbye. That's enough of that. I am not going to go into dopey world of writing books, painting pictures, and living a very happy life, doing long interviews in Sarasota. We're going to get. We're, yeah, we're going to get back to your book in a minute. Just one question, Don King. I mean, 
Good guy, bad guy, uh, you know what? Complicated what? guy. Mm -hmm. He doesn't do anything they don't let him do. Who's that? Or the boxing regulation, the IRS, the United States government, they've been after this guy. You can't imagine how they in investigate everything he does. He's always in trial. He's mm -hmm. up, but they never can get him mm -hmm. because he's too smart. Because if that guy had been white and was in Hollywood, he'd run one of the major studios like that. If he was in Detroit, he'd, he'd own General Motors or Ford. Maybe because this guy, don't make no mistake, the people that succeed black or white are the people that work 24 hours a day at what they do. 24 hours a day this guy works. I mean, when I was head of, of NBC making fights and, and, and the boxing, and they were, he, he would call me like 2 in the morning. Listen, about this fight, and I'd say, Don, is the sun shining where you're at? He says, no. I said, call me when the sun's shining. I only work in the daytime. I'm the reverse of vampires. I, I hang up the phone and I go, so you can't hang up on me? I said, oh, yes, I can. Don't call me at night. But this guy worked that hard. He, he started out a very crooked man. He killed two people. Started out the did, did jail. He came out and he put together the biggest miracle in the world. If we had two hours, I couldn't tell you all the Africa stories of putting that fight at Wazir. 18 people that I can think of got shot by the government. For, dip, for doing things like misspelling the president's name on tickets. You cannot imagine the danger he was in. He almost didn't produce a fight. Foreman almost dropped out in the last minute. Things were happening there at such an amazing rate that any minute they were going to shoot him. Mm. And yet he got by. And when he got by, he got to be the biggest guy in the world. And he stayed. It looked like he's now got Tyson and Holyfield. Both of them. I mean, he's hanging on by a, by a toenail, but he's there. And he keeps producing these shows. So you have, I have to give grudging admiration to a guy who's had that many years of unrelenting success and stayed out of jail. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of my friends that are in politics went to jail. <laughs> a lot of bank presidents are on the way, a couple I know. You know, you know the, the new thing that I like? In Miami, I don't know how it is here, it's still too small for that. In Miami, they're in such a haste to name streets after people, you know. Ferdy Pacheco Drive, you know, one of those things. Sure. But you don't know, they, so they name a street after a banker. And I say, that guy is a drug launderer. He, he's laundering money. And he turned state's evidence so that the guy that he was doing went to jail. And that's how he built his banks, on the money he laundered. They name a street going right through the middle of Miami after him, then a tennis complex, and then a whole ballpark after him. In the meantime, he gets caught, A, for sexual harassment of two of his female employees. Guess who? His CPA and his lawyer. Uh-oh. And both of those blackmail him for $300,000 to shut up. He pays the $300 out of bank funds, not his own profit. Uh-oh. And on top of that, they catch him bribing the mayor, and he doesn't go to jail. Here's, here's what I love about our new system. He doesn't go to jail for bribing the mayor for two or three years. Two or three years, he's writing checks every week. Checks like he's on a payroll. He goes to jail because he lied to the grand jury about doing that. <laughs> Not because he did it, but because he like, oh, was, oh, 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 I'm sorry, I changed it. I did bribe the girl. Okay, you don't have to go to jail. So he goes in. And guess what? The name's still up there. The street is still his street. The tennis complex is still his. The, I mean, I can't, what are we living in? What example are we giving to, to the people? Now, so, now uh, in contrast, Ferdy, you know, let's talk about Nick Nusio, who was the mayor of Tampa <laughs> for so many years. One of my years. favorite people. Guy was a legend. But talk about, you know, let's let let's, let's it was a, different a little era. bit. It was yeah. a different era. Right. And and the era was this. In the in the era of the third, you know, we just had elections in Miami where they discovered, guess what? They voted some dead people in the election. I said, Are you kidding? Read my books. We've been doing that since in Tampa since the beginning. One of my jobs is to go to the cemetery of Morgan Street and get all the Confederate dead and vote them. There are more guys in the Confederate Army that voted for <laughs> for, for Nixon or Nuncio and all those kind of guys. We go get the terminal ill list. The people that were dying that night, boom, we voted those. The ones that died the day before, boom, we voted those. The ones in insane asylum, we voted those. I mean, we had a list of people that were, that were incredible that we were. Well, it was so crooked in those days. It was the accepted norm. If you're a politician, you're supposed to be crooked. You're only making like three or $4,000 a year, but you're living in a big house and you're driving an Oldsmobile. How? Well, Nuccio was one of those kind of guys who... Although he was Italian, could neither speak English correctly, Spanish correctly, nor Italian. I don't know what the hell he was talking about. I mean, it was some, at some point, you could understand him. And he was the sweetest, nicest guy because his philosophy was, you're in politics to do things for people. That's why my painting of him in the book shows him right. negotiating with a guy on the street. I had seen him sit. I'd sit with him for coffee. He was a wonderful guy. I'd come up and sing. 
Nick, you got to help me. What? They won't give a driver's license to my mother. He says, your mother? Your mother's around about 85. And she, she says, yes, she is, and she's blind. But she <laughs> And he says, but he does, she doesn't drive. She just wants to have her driver's license. Why can't she have it? He says, well, give me your name. I'll fix it for you. And he'd send her a driver's license. You know what I mean? It was like, that's what you did. You did favors for people. You know, my son can't get a job. Put him in the garbage. Tell him to run over to the, to the, to the garbage department. But and there was jobs for everybody. There was things. You were there to serve the people. You were pro in exchange for which you stole all the money you wanted with impunity. I mean, he, he, he paved everything. That was moved. I mean, wherever there was an empty lot, he paved it, and he, he charged by the inch how, how much he was going to get, and signed each one of them. That's why on this painting you see it says, you know, courtesy of the, uh, yeah. Nuzio. And they, they, they literally put it in the, on it. I mean, he, he ever, yeah, it's like you're signing right. what you what you what you got the bribes for, what you got payola <laughs> for. You signed it, but but you know, and then I grew up in that. I grew up in, in I, the other one of my other jobs as I got old enough to drive a truck was to get a flatbed Model A, drive by where they used to call in Tampa the meat market, which was where all the black people were assembled to do day work. Put them all on the truck, drive them to Palmetto Beach, where you can wear it, it was really crooked, and, and pay them a dollar apiece to vote for whoever you wanted them to vote for. Then take them to work, to the fields, and then pick them up in the fields, bring them back and vote them at night again for $2 <laughs> apiece. I mean, it was like, the, the, uh, I'm going to stop with politics, but the ultimate political story, and it's so God, I swear to God, true, they, they, were, they had a voting poll in a two-story house, wooden two-story house. Downstairs where we were at, we had headquarters. Upstairs was a voting, voting poll. And, the, and remember, they didn't have, this was possible because they didn't have uh, machines. They had boxes. So you came in with a yellow box, a yellow vote for Nixon, or Hickson, whatever his name was, and a white vote for the other guy. And you could see who was voting for who. Then the guy that was the, the supervisor of that had a wooden leg. This is an absolute truth that happened. He had a wooden leg, like Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. And when a vote would come for the other side that we didn't want, you know, he'd count like three votes come, he would stomp his foot three times. And downstairs we would hear that, oh, three votes came in. We'd, we'd get our Confederate <laughs> list, or I think we'd send up three more votes. We'd neutralize them. You know, this went on all day long, guys. Five more votes. Get the, get the terminal list. Get the, to see who. We, I mean, it was like, it was, you could write a satire on the whole thing. Yeah. So therefore, when the people stole, we expected them to steal. You know, we were like the prostitutes and the pimps. We, we, we want our pimp to look good. We want mm -hmm. our politician to look good. We want him to look, have a good car. We want the mayor to have good suits and have a good car. He's the mayor of Tampa. He deserves it. And so uh, um, when all of this began happening in, 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 in Miami, we now have the circus of having the mayor of Miami having a nervous breakdown on public. I mean, we got Xavier going crazy in, in public there. And he's, people have voted that are dead, and he's telling, he, the other, last night, he, I mean, this can only happen in Miami, I, better than Tampa. He gets on and he talks to the, on Cuban radio, he says to people, you don't have to talk to the law when they come to see you. <laughs> Here's the mayor telling people not to, not to talk to the law. He says, oh my God, Xavier is gone. And so anyway, Tampa was a fun city. It was the height of the immigrant experience. I call it a utopia because we live so happily, because we were taken care of from cradle to grave. From the moment you were born, you were born in a clinic, free. All the way, all medicine, operations, drugs, x-rays, free. You died, you went to their cemetery, and your, your society, Cemetery Centro Español, Centro Aturiano, mm -hmm. and got buried. And in the interim, you led a very carefree and happy life. There were work, there were, you know, there were strikes, there were things, there were problems, there was a depression. But, you know, when I, Ebor, I, I, when, I always when have... Did, when did Ebor City, though, Ferdy, you know, you go up there now, and it's a fun place to visit, but the characters all changed. I mean, well, because... You, you, the, you've, you've, you've got sort of the, this modern-day uh, neo the only thing mall, The only thing uh, is left is it's, it's, it's a Disneyland. It, it's an amusement park. Uh, what it was, a, a, a place like that exists while the need and the reason for it to exist, which was the cigar industry, which was produced 600 million cigars. It was the heartbeat of Tampa. When they got a cold, Tampa got pneumonia. You know what I mean? It was sure. like they needed us. We didn't need them. We didn't need the American at all for anything. They needed us. We were the industry. We were everything. So this throbbing community of immigrant workers then came into a complete stumbling block. A, the lectors were gone. B, they learned how to make cigars with machines without the handmade cigar. Mm -hmm. Cigarettes came in during the war, cigars went out. It wasn't fashionable to smoke a cigar and be spitting all the time. Cigarettes looked great. 
You saw it in the movies. Every movie star smoked a cigar. You never saw a guy smoking a cigar, unless he was a gangster or somebody bad smoking right. a cigar. The women began smoking cigarettes. During the war, it was permitted. Before the war, you wouldn't see a woman smoking a cigarette in the street, not unless she was a prostitute. Mm -hmm. But now, everybody smokes cigarettes. The, the cigar workers were now in their 60s. And they all died of emphysema from smoking continuously or lung cancer. They died early. We, the, the, the offspring, went Next off to generation. the Second World War, came back to GI Bill of Rights, hurriedly got an education, got the hell out of Ebor, and went over to live in Davis Island. I mean, as soon as we could get out of there, we got out of there. Mm -hmm. Like the blacks went, got out of the ghetto. It reminded me of the same thing when they told me that. And so what we had was an empty vacuum. The old people died, nobody could move in. Who moved in? The indigent, which were blacks in this case, but they moved into Ebor City because it would, the, the houses were empty, would rent for nothing. Mm -hmm. And it became a shambles, and the government came in with urban renewal, some mistaken, dippy notion that they would wreck everything and rebuild. They wrecked, and they didn't rebuild anything. It looked like Vietnam through half there. I mean, it was like they just wrecked the whole of Ebor yeah. City, never rebuilt it. What did they leave? They left the main street and all the good buildings. And so, therefore, what I'm saying now is what we're trying to do now, which is to rebuild Ebor City, it's not to rebuild what we had. That's gone. It's never going to come back. It's no longer a need for cigar industry there. There's no need for workers. There's no need for family living there. We, Ybor City was Ybor City because families lived every minute of their lives there. The grocery stores, the cleaners, the dentists, the doc everybody was right there on 7th Avenue. You don't have a family and you don't need doctors, dentists, CPAs, cleaning, uh, you know, cleaning establishments, hat manufacturers. You don't need that. Mm -hmm. What you'd only need is what they have now, Disneyland. I mean, yeah. a bunch of rides. I mean, they got a bunch of freaks riding motorcycles there every once in a while. They're now beginning with the Columbia Restaurant, the streetcar that we're going to put in there, which we, it's going to come in the next two years. And you're going to be the conductor. I'm definitely conducting on that. And the, the uh, people like the Cocoa Walk people from, New, uh, from Miami are retaking over. I'm working with them with the Centro Español. Huge hotel will go in there a huge multiplex theater. Now you'll see young kids in there. Now you see people dating. You won't worry about where to park your car. They'll have a parking garage. Yeah. Money is like, you know, as Red Fox used to say, it's like blood. It's got to circulate. Before we leave, let me tell you a Red Fox story. One quick Red Fox story, okay. if we have the time. Okay. Ali is going to box an exhibition for Bingham, which in itself is incredibly funny. Bingham is a guy that stutters so badly, he can hardly talk, he's running for Congress. I mean, I, they called me to come from, from Miami to work. I said, if Bingham is running, and so long, if he gets elected, I want to be there when he makes his first speech. Because it's got to take like a week for him to get through the first speech. You know, he, this guy stutters. So the idea that Bingham is running for Congress is so appealing and funny to me, I decide I got to be there. This is part of the alley circus. So I go, and I take a guy named Shelly Saltman with me. Shelly Saltman is the president of 20th Century Fox Sports. The only thing you got to know about Shelly Saltman is this. He is the guy that Evil Knievel, that wonderful American, beat up with a baseball bat because he wrote a bad book about him. <laughs> right on the lot of 20th Century Fox, he had two people grab hold of him and he beat him with a Louisville slugger. And they didn't stop him, wonderful Hollywood, because everybody just thought they were shooting a movie. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> here's the vice president of 20th Century Fox being beat up with, <laughs> with a baseball bat with crazy Evil Knievel. Well, you know, uh, broken arms. And so this is many years later. Two or three years later. So we're sitting there, and in comes Red Fox, who may be the funniest man I ever knew in America. Funny, off the top of his head, funny. So he walks in, hi, Doc, how you doing? And Ali, who's very, loves to get in, says, hey, Red, I bet you don't know who that, that little guy next to Doc is, the guy with the gray hair. Says, no, I don't. He says, that's Shelly Salmon, Vice President of 20th Century Fox. I said, hello, Mr. Salmon, nice to meet you, very nice. He says, nah, you don't know what he really did. You know what he's famous for. He says, what? He says, evil can evil. Remember when he beat a guy up with a baseball bat? That's the guy that he beat up with a baseball bat. Well, Red Fox, off the top of his head, split second, he said, Evil Knievel is nothing, man. That's a white man's fantasy, Evil Knievel. Well, the black people had a better guy, a guy, guy named Evil K. Johnson. <laughs> he says, used to jump the Arkansas River in brand new Cadillacs. <laughs> I mean, they were on the floor laughing, and Ali, who believes anything about blacks, Ali with his innocent face says, Golly, no kidding. What happened to him? He says, well, he repossessed his car in mid-jump, and nobody's ever found him since. I said, damn, Red Fox, you got, you got some kind of mind on you. I said, you just think that up, or is that a joke? He said, no, that's, a, you know. I, it's, you know, the thing about Ali 
You, you could say, Ali, my whole life is, uh, if you got a sense of humor yourself, you appreciate it so much in others. I mean, the people around Ali, one, one thing, uh, you know, stereotypes black people, is, uh, black people have a wonderful sense of humor. Unfortunately, I, I, I decry the, um, the, the people I see on television on those comedy hours because they have become so shrill and they talk about nothing but sex. But the, the black humor that I was associated with in the ghetto when I was there, they were so funny with themselves. You know, it was such a sense of fun, a, a sense of looking at life in a funny way. If they could have just written it that way, if they could just do it that way. Mm -hmm. And people like Red, who was extremely dirty when he wanted to be, but he had such a good, funny way of looking at things. Uh, um, many of the early comics had great things. Now all these young kids just get on and talk about sex, which is, I mean, girls, it's, it's, it's become so shrill, it's not funny, and it's mm -hmm. unfair to the, to the black people. I think where the, where the black people, if I, if I had to think of something that they did beyond, outside of sports, beyond anything that we've ever known in this country, is, is their contribution to uh, music, to jazz. Mm -hmm. it's, a black, it's a black thing. The blues started it, and it went on to, to swing, and it went on to bop, and it went on to progressive, and there's still nobody can play. No. Nobody can play like black people. I mean, there was, every once in a while, a white guy like Benny Goodman comes along and masters an instruments and plays with a great deal of force. Harry James played me good. But basically, boy, those people, without knowing music, can play more music that's ever written. Right. He plays more. There was a, a great quote that I... I, 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 I don't want to cut you off here, but before we can. run out I of mean, time, I know. You know, you've got the Ebor City Chronicles. You've got the Pacheco's Art of Ebor City, all available at Sarasota uh, new book and, Books and News. One of the great yeah, and, places. Uh, and what, what are we looking for in the future? You've got the Columbia Restaurant book. Well, uh, we're coming, we, we yeah. have two books coming out uh, the, through the University Press. One of them is next year. The uh, Christmas Eve cookbook with my wife, Lucita, we did 225 recipes of Noche Buena, as celebrated by the Italians. They're all different, Spaniards, Cubans, uh, all, Sicilian. All, all from your... Uh, just your, in Ybor City, yeah. and Jews. And because my wife is of Mexican heritage, a, a Mexican book, too. I mean, a Mexican recipe, yeah. in case you want to eat your brains out. You can eat that on your Christmas Eve and, and sweat yourself all during your... And red-faced all during... You can look like Santa Claus. On. I mean, I, I can't eat Mexican food. My wife's the greatest Mexican food cook in the world, but, boy, it's, it's, I'll tell state secrets before I eat that. God, I can't eat that. But oh. she, she can eat it. Anyway, that's going to be illustrated, and I have 25 wonderful Ybor City stories which, I, you know, it's no point in getting into them. Uh, but but there, I just went to people like you, and I said, whatever happened to you on, on Christmas Eve? Did you like it, or didn't you like it? And thinking, I'll get one or two. And I started to get this incredible accumulation of stories, you know what I mean? And the guy said, no, it's great. And I said, now think about it. Did anything ever happen to you on New Year's Eve that was kind of strange? And all of it, yeah, I remember one New Year's Eve, and then these yeah. great stories but came out. But Noche Buena, according to your book, was a time that was like open house. It was the greatest open house thing. You just went from one house to the other, and that's how yeah. I, I got. I got. That's how I got the story. They had, a, they had a piper that came on where he ever came from. I don't know. I put him in one of my my paintings. Right. He would come in and play, and he'd leave. He'd have a drink, and he'd leave. I mean, it was just a wonderful. Now, everybody had the same food. I mean, you know, you're, you're eating turkey here and you're eating pork there. And the same thing. I mean, the Italians ate fish a lot, you know, a snapper and different things. And uh, uh, then uh, the, the, the next book, that's going to be it. That's going to be four books for Ybor City. And that's, I think I will have established Ybor City as a historical entity of the state with four books like nobody's ever done for any place else. Right. And I think that's it. I'm going to start working on a book of paintings for the Cuban refugee um, experience, which I'm now in our 30 some odd years. I was there from the very beginning, and I was there all the way through the Bay of Pigs and, and Mariel and, and uh, everything those poor guys went through. And, uh, where, and where, I have where, a great feeling for where Cubans. Where should we go? Great where, feelings where, for should, where should we go with Cuba now? The Pope visited last week. You, where, you're where, not where, going anywhere until that man dies. The man is the devil incarnate, and he, to him, for him to meet the Pope, by the way, the Pope. Looks like he's got Parkinson's. Did you take a look at him? Mm -hmm. I said, see what Ali started? I will drive, <laughs> flying all over the place. If it was normal, I'd say, stay home, man. You got, you got Parkinson's. Live it out at the Vatican, you know. No, Ali's doing it. I can do it, you know. Right. So, but he, man, he's stumbling around. His hands are shaking. He's left-handed. He's got his head dropped. He's got Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. He can't walk straight without stumbling forward. That poor guy is going to be used by Castro. He's the most intelligent man. 
But he survived 30 years. He's right. wrecked that island. What he did was unconscionable. He's never going to leave. Where's he going to go to? I mean, where will he accept him? Mm -hmm. He is an incredible... Do you know that he stayed at my house? He stayed at my house with my mother in an upstairs, downstairs in 1906 Lamar. We went off to college. My father died. She rented up the upstairs. Rented it to him when he was on the lamb, you know. He says, for a, a month, she says, I got a bunch of humans living upstairs. They keep killing chickens and cooking them, and they talk all night long, and they got these, these, these I, I got to throw them out of here. I said, tell them to leave. And they left. They, they, but it was Castro for 30 days at my house upstairs. And she said, that guy talked all night long. All night long. You know, she, could, she had ears that, you know, she couldn't sleep if anybody was talking in the house. She could hear it. And she didn't sleep for 30 days. She threw him, uh, as, you know. But that's my connection to Fidel. Otherwise, I don't want to have anything to do with him at all. Yeah. I mean, he, you got to recognize his brilliance. you got to recognize he's a great, and like O.J. Simpson and various other criminals that show up someplace, wherever they show up, there's always a crowd of people that want to see him. I was at the Olympics calling the fights for NBC. He was right down, right down a few rows from me. Lines of people trying to see that guy. I don't know how they didn't kill him. No, I don't know. They, they, they went through all this trouble to try to kill him in Havana. Right. In the Barcelona, he was walking around with three or four bodyguards behind him. Anybody, anybody could have, I could have taken a shot at the guy. I mean, anybody could have. He went and sat by the king of Spain. Everybody was like, like in the presence of Valley. He is, you know, he is a big figure, and people love him. Hmm. For, for one reason alone, we love famous people. Mm -hmm. That's should, it. Should we, should we, Ferdy, get into trade agreements with Cuba, do you think? I don't know. You know, I, I have stayed away from Cuban politics so much. Because it's so controversial. The, the, the two things that I, I mean, I, this program played in, in various sections of where just what we just did would have got me an enormous amount of trouble with Black Leaves. Or we'll still, maybe still, we'll take things I say out of context. Won't we'll see what my overall thought is or my overall record in life with black people is. Mm -hmm. And we'll narrow in on something. Oh, they're never going to be different because of the color of their skins. They'll, they'll narrow in on that. Cubans are the same. You, you can say anything. About, they're just so polarized about them, they're blinded, they're, they're just like, and so you, there's no way you can make reasonable statements about what could be done with Cuba. His man is 70-something. I mean, he ain't going to be living to 100, you know, somebody will either get him by then or he's going to kind of step aside. Without him, Cuba falls apart. I mean, without him, his brother's nothing. Nobody's anything there. They need, I mean, I always said, laughingly, but I'm not laughing, said, I said years ago, they would have beaten Cuba if they just introduced Visa and MasterCard. I mean, you know, once you get the idea, I don't have to pay for that, I just did card. <laughs> yeah. And then you get the bills, uh oh, I owe twelve thousand dollars to MasterCard, you know. I mean, because what they needed was capitalism to I mean, because they, they're they're still driving around in nineteen fifty six Fords. You know, I mean mm -hmm. come on, it's it's time to come to the century. Whole people have been grown up and are thirty some odd years old and don't know that they can eat beans and rice every day if they want to, and there's platinos every day. All I have to do is swim 90 miles to Key West, and they can eat like savages, you know. So it's really a, what happened there is a great tragedy because Cuba was truly, of all of South America, was the most desirable place to live in because it was the United States in Spanish. It's better than Puerto Rico even because mm -hmm. they, they, they were like, they call them the Jews of the Caribbean in a, in a flattering way. They're such businessmen. They're so industrious. They had the United States. They had our Constitution. They had our White House. They had us reproduced down there. And everybody was living good. Everybody. One president came in, one president went out. It didn't make any difference. You just change crooks and everybody keep on going, you know. <laughs> right. And we changed them. Cordell Hall and all those people, you, uh, Sumner Wells. It's your time to get out. It's your time to come in. We're, we put in Castro. Right. We thought he was Abraham Lincoln because he had a beard. It took us a year and some odd to figure out he was a communist. How did that happen? The guy is got surrounded by Che Guevara on one side. His brother just graduated from the University of Warsaw, of, of Moscow, Moscow right. and, and came out of uh, China. And we're saying, nah, but he's not communist. <laughs> right. What are those red stars doing all over the I mean, what was the matter with us? So anyway, Cuba is not one of those things that's... One last story about Cuba. And okay, well, we're, we're, we're almost out of time, all and right. I want to tell people, for the, uh, Let, Let's talk about that. Your, they want your book. Uh, Ybor City Chronicles or Pacheco's Art of uh, Ybor City. It's and, at, uh, and the Columbia Cookbook. All of right. them. Sarasota News and books on uh, Main, Main Street. The old Charlie's News. Uh, the old Charlie's News. It's. I bet you don't know what street it's on. Main and what? Mm. Mm. Palm Avenue. 
At th man is when you're on, you're on. Okay. It's 1341, something like that. Third, I bet. Yeah. And I'm bad on numbers. Okay. I mean, well, I bet, I'll, I'll I bet tell you what. Anyways, it's, 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 I really Dick, enjoyed it. My, and my friend Dick Lobo and his beautiful wife, he was in television all the time. And, and I always thought he was a dope with the first water, you know, because he never read anything, you know. <laughs> now he's in the bookstore and he's got to read, you know. Right. So now I, I changed my opinion of Dick. I think he's a well informed and wonderful guy who's very intelligent to talk especially to. Especially because he's got a bookstore. And, and especially since he's selling the book. Hey, hey Ferdy, Ferdy, Ferdy since we've enjoyed having you here. We want to have you back again. You're always welcome. Oh, I welcome. think we've talked our way up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't well, think you want to see me again for nah, 10 years. Ferdy, we've nah. said all we need to say. <laughs> Listen, I tell you what, if they firebomb your building, don't call me. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't say any of those things. I didn't mean it. Okay, Ferdy. And with that, uh, we hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, this has been a, a, a wonderful time with a, a great storyteller, great man uh, who's uh, already led a great life, and we look forward to seeing what he's going to do in the future. So until next Tuesday night, uh, have a good week, and we'll see you right back here in Dateline, Sarasota. Good night. Mm -hmm.